Uh, welcome, uh, welcome to uh, the second podcast for the channel Lanka Wildlife. Today, I'm delighted to introduce you to uh, Asoka Yapa, uh, noted Sri Lankan naturalist, and Burton Lim, who is uh, the assistant curator of mammalogy from the Royal Ontario Museum in Canada. Uh, I have uh, in my presence uh, about this book uh, written by Asoka, which is uh, the uh, mammals of Sri Lanka, which is uh, approximately well more than five kilograms, uh, more than five <laughs> kilograms in weight. So uh, I'm still trying to establish exactly how heavy it is. I might try to do that later on. And also, um, so uh, Asoka has uh, has been working a little bit with Burton with with regards to uh, bats in Sri Lanka. But hopefully, we're just going to be having a general discussion with regards to the need for biodiversity studies, particularly with a focus on the Oriental region. Um, so right now. Uh, Burton has uh, been specialized. Uh, he has done uh, research on the on the embalurinidae. Emb Emb how do you how do you say that, Burton? Uh, the sheath tail bats is a common name. C can you can you can you say that word again? Uh, Embalunuridae. Embalunuridae, and that's from that's from South America. Uh, well, they're they're found uh, throughout the world. Um, I did my uh, PhD. A dissertation on only the ones in South America, um, but that family is found throughout the world. Okay, um, can I just um, find out roughly? Do you know how many how many species there are in that family? Rough, roughly, it could that could be roughly hundreds, maybe? Uh, it's uh, probably just it's it's about a hundred species in that family. Hundred species. Okay, so right now, uh, as we were kind of having a a bit of a discussion earlier. Bats, bats are a hot topic uh, with regards to COVID and they're like suspected uh, uh, vectors of, of the virus. Do you have any views about that? Uh, well, um, bats, the, um, the coronaviruses in bats um, are very similar to the ones in humans. Um, they're actually um, about 5% different uh, as far as the DNA um, content. Uh, but the, uh, yeah, so the, the real question that people are trying to find out is, um, you know, what was the intermediate species that actually transmitted, um, you know, the virus, you know, to humans. Uh, so the bats uh, in the wild have the closest ones that people have found, um, but they're different enough that they're, they're not the uh, coronavirus that the humans have, but they're the, the closest ones to it. So at, at, the, at the moment, uh, there is a team investigating all these matters, uh, in a WHO team in Wuhan, uh, I believe. And uh, I think uh, one of the lead people is uh, Dr. Desak, Peter Desak, yeah, who indeed. is a bat specialist uh, uh, out of uh, the UK. So, I mean, I'm sure all these things will be um, sort of um, explored and clarified uh, in the months to come. Uh, Burton, you agree with, with that? But yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think, um, you know, they've been trying to find, uh, you know, the intermediate host, uh, not only for the current COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but also going back to SARS in uh, 2003. Um, so uh, again, they haven't found um, the actual, you know, host that had transmitted the disease to humans. Um, but the, the closest uh, virus um, that we know of so far are, are, are in bats. So there, there's no denying that. Um, no. But, yeah. but they're different enough that they, they didn't transmit them directly to humans. Yes. But, uh, you know, just beyond that, Burton, uh, the, you know, the bats are, are, are an amazing group because uh, they host a, a massive number of uh, viruses. Uh, and they don't seem to be affected by these uh, uh, th these viruses. So, uh, could you sort of <clears throat> explain to the audience why that might be? Uh, well, um, there's a lot of people trying to figure out, you know, why that is. Uh, but I think that is um, one of the things that um, you know we want, we need to find out, is that um, you know, as Ahsoka said, uh, you know, that bats have a lot of viruses, um, but they seem to be asymptomatic. They seem to be healthy. Uh, so now, um, yeah, so basically, whenever these viruses, um, you know, jump over to humans, uh, they're deadly. Uh, so, you know, we're obviously trying to find uh, you know, cures for these as far as, you know, vaccines go. Um, so I think uh, studying um, the bat DNA, uh, I think, will be a start to find out, you know, how, 
um, you know, we can, you know, help the human, you know, population, you know, by developing, you know, medical treatments, you know, such as vaccines. Yeah, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, uh, even if that's had started, uh, you know, they, they are the origin of these coronaviruses, or, or at least the ones that are closest to what we have uh, infecting us today, uh, it seems to me that they might also provide the answer. Uh, yeah, yeah that, that's true. And, and, and that's one of the things. Um, um, yeah, so there's also looking at, you know, the bat DNA to find out, you know, what the differences are between, um, you know, the viruses that are found in bats and the viruses that are found in humans. Um, but also to look at it from the virus perspective, um, you know, to find out, you know, you know, what are the different types of viruses. Uh, and then also, you know, developing, you know, vaccines, because, you know, there, there will be another pandemic um, yeah. you know, that will uh, that will happen will uh, will uh, outbreak you know soon. Um, so it, the, the question is really just you know keeping ahead of the curve. Um, if we're more prepared, we'll be able we'll be able to uh, make sure it doesn't you know you know become a, a pandemic. It'll be localized. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, Rajit, if you don't mind, uh, I, I want to ask Burton through evolutionary time, what are the pressures that uh, was um, upon uh, the bats uh, that made them uh, uh, host and um, were able to ward off the the predations of these virus groups and viruses well, well, through evolutionary time. Yeah, well, that, that's another good question uh, that you know people are trying to look into. Uh, one of the ideas is that. Um, you know, bats are, are mammals, but they're very unique mammals because, you know, they're the only mammals that fly. Uh, and there, there's a lot of other sort of um, unique differences. Um, you know, uh, bats are small mammals and usually the small mammals like, you know, shrews and, and rats and mice, uh, usually uh, the small things are very short lived. Um, whereas bats are the opposite. They're small, but they're actually, you know, relatively long lived. Um, and uh, so that's another sort of unique aspect about them. And of course, we just mentioned that they have a lot of viruses, but they seem to be healthy. Um, yeah, so that, that's a lot of things that um, make them unique and what, you know, people are trying to study them a little bit more thoroughly to find out, you know, why they are unique. And, and hopefully, you know, we can find answers, you know, to, you know, things such as, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, uh, now we, in, in Sri Lanka, we have about 30 species of bats. Yeah, in fact, that I think it's 31 now, um, or maybe 32. But um, are there any species there which may be of concern to to human health? Uh, well, there are some uh, horseshoe bats, rhinolophus. Yeah. Uh, so those have been uh, that genus um, has been. Uh, the group that has been implicated um, as being one of the natural reservoirs uh, for coronaviruses. Uh, so those are also found in Sri Lanka. Uh, so it would be good to, um, you know, study those a little bit more thoroughly. Um, as you say, you know, are there 30, 31, or 32 species? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so so something as basic as knowing, you know, the number of species of bats in Sri Lanka, uh, even that type of basic information uh, you know, we're not 100% sure. So I, I think there still needs to be a lot of, you know, work that needs to be done in Sri Lanka on that. Yes. And, yeah, and, so, yeah. Sorry. But no, I just wanted to ask, I mean, at the beginning of this uh, coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic, they were talking about pangolins as possible, uh, possible uh, vectors. Uh, now, pangolins and bats and humans, uh, very, very different uh, degrees of relationship. Uh, now, to brush up on my own taxonomic knowledge, I'm aware, for example, that the that the that the order, I mean, historically bats have been connected with the with, with the primate order, uh, although recently uh, the rodents have been connected with the with the primate order. Uh, are bats still in the running with regards to a relationship with humans? And is the relationship actually important when it comes to the transmission of viruses? Uh, well, bats are relatively distantly distantly related uh, to uh, the primates. Uh, and to rodents. Uh, so bats are uh, considered to be in a fairly diverse group of mammals uh, that includes like the shrews, uh, but also, you know, things such as the carnivores, um, artiodactyls, the hoofed mammals, uh, and whales. So actually, if, I may, 
if I can stop you in that, that actually, actually the thing is in, in looking at it in, in terms of super orders, uh, the bats are in that case in a completely different different branch to the to the one that involves because I'm trying to remember the ones that involve the hum, uh, the primates. So it's primates plus rodents plus uh, rabbits and hares, I think, and I can't think of any yeah. others. Historically, bats were linked with, with with this group, but now. I mean, to talk, to say that they're actually connected with artiodactyls, that's actually quite a different kind of different section. Yes. A different uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, originally they were considered um, closely related uh, to um, like primates, uh, primarily based on morphological data. Yes. Uh, and, and really it was only one group of bats, the, the, the old world fruit bats, uh, the ones that don't echolocate. Uh, you know, because, you know, those are the bats that are, are more active um, in the daytime. They have big eyes. Um, they can yeah. see. Um, yeah, so, but uh, then with DNA data, um, that sort of uh, told us that they just superficially, you know, look like primates, um, but genetically, they're actually more similar, um, you know, to this other, you know, group of, of mammals. Right, 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 right. Yeah, so they're like uh, what you call um, convergent evolution then. Yeah. So, so it, it looks like uh, genetic relationships aren't really that, that important when it comes to viruses jumping from one species to another. I mean, we might have, we might have got a connection between smallpox and cattle theoretically, uh, or we might have a relation. I mean, so it doesn't, doesn't make a big difference, does it, when it comes to at least viruses jumping between mammals uh, the specific genetic relationship doesn't matter. It, uh, what what matters is probably a, a connection, a kind of physical connection between two unrelated organisms to enable the virus to maybe mutate one, one way or another and jump into another one. Uh, yeah, a, a lot of it is just just you know being opportune. Um, you know, there's a lot yes. of you know viruses that jump between species, um, and they, you know they're not harmful to humans. Um, but, you know, the odd time where something does jump um, and then they are deadly. And I mean, those are the ones we know. I mean, there's, you know, tons of other viruses, you know, that, you know, humans have probably got from other animals, but, you know, we're totally fine. Um, so it, it's really, um, you know, those opportunities like in, you know, the wet markets, you know, where a lot of different live animals are kept together, you know, uh, yeah, so you know, normally in the wild, you know, they, they wouldn't be together, but, you know, now they're in cages that are like, you know, one foot apart. Uh, and of course, people are there buying them. Uh, so there, there's that opportunity, you know, for different types of wildlife to intermingle, you know, when normally they wouldn't, you know, encounter each other. Uh, but now you also have humans there. So yeah. if viruses do jump, you know, uh, you know, they could jump the humans uh, and some of them are deadly. Uh, no, one so, of the uh, again, one it's, of the, it's the luck of the draw, really. Uh, you know, with these uh, coronaviruses. One one of the fortunate things in Sri Lanka is that uh, we don't have markets that uh, position, say, pangolins and bats together in wet markets. We don't. Have, uh, pangolins are hunted, right, uh, Rajit? I would say. Uh, yeah, they, now they are hunted because of there's a Chinese interest, I think. Oh, I see. Okay, and and yes. so uh, there is some hunting. Uh, there wasn't much at all before, uh, but uh, this, uh, uh, but they are not kept in 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 spaces where they they are uh, so close together that, as you say, Burton, uh, there is um, room for them to cross species. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I think that that that's the key. Um, but again, uh, you know, I, I I don't want to um, you know uh, badmouth or sound negative about wet markets because that you know in a lot of places you know that is you know their custom of having the markets um, and that, and that's how they get fresh food, right? Yeah. So you know, for me, I'll, I'll go to the supermarket and buy something frozen and thaw it out. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but that's just you know the way I do things. Um, there's other parts of the world where um, you know the social sure. you know aspect of it is based around you know uh, fresh food, uh, you know fresh markets and stuff like that. And and even uh, even economic aspects. Yeah. Uh, yeah yeah yeah. So um, yeah so it's really trying to you know um, figure out the best way you know to you know work within. You know, uh, you know the parameters of what people do, just you know, to keep everybody safer. Well, 
if I can kind of uh, move in a slightly more geographical direction. Um, now, firstly, I think that uh, it's a wonderful thing, Burton, that you have had some kind of connection uh, in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, but I mean, speaking geographically, Canada is basically a world apart from uh, the, the parts of the world that you have worked in in the Orient, like, you know, you've been involved in Operation Wallacea. So Canada is a world apart. I mean, at the moment, it's like minus 17 degrees in Canada, or at least in <laughs> Toronto, it might be about minus 17. And I mean, if you, if you compare Canada with, with another holarctic, uh, holarctic uh, nation next door, it's Russia. Now, I have been to Russia, I've been to Novosibirsk, and I think that the Russians had their finger in the Indian pie in the 19th century and little, little bits of uh, relationships since then. But actually, uh, Russians have really not necessarily done internationally noted, noted uh, work with regards to uh, Asian mammals, uh, I mean, leaving aside probably the Himalayas, whereas the British Empire was heavily involved, I mean, obviously, uh, in India and, uh, and, and South Asia. And, all, and um, through this kind of connection, I think that Canada must have had some kind of foothold into, into the study of, I mean, study of mammals. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is, it's just very interesting that, I mean, United States being a world power, they've, had, they've, had sub, they've developed substantial connections with the collections from the rest of the world, including Sri Lanka, although they don't actually specialize in Asia. They've actually got more stuff to do with South America, whereas Britain has got the biggest collection of uh, uh, Asian um, specimens, I think. Uh, but but uh, thanks to Britain, I think that Australia and possibly Canada have also got some kind of mammalogical relationship. Is that, is that correct? I mean, is that how Canada comes into this area? Um, well, um, at least my institution, the Royal Ontario Museum, um, you know, for us, uh, it wasn't until the 1950s uh, and, and uh, early uh, 1960s. Um, yeah, so, you know, the Royal Ontario Museum started off as a provincial museum. Uh, but uh, for whatever reason, in the 1950s, um, uh, the Board of Trustees wanted a, uh, a more global, um, you know, sort of mandate uh, in the, you know, the things that we studied. Uh, so uh, really in the natural history departments, uh, we actually started branching out, you know, beyond Ontario, beyond Canada. Um, so in fact, I don't think, at least for the natural history uh, departments at the museum, uh, I don't think it was necessarily a British Commonwealth connection. Uh, mm -hmm. It was just a desire that, you know, um, you know, the ROM, you know, should, you know, uh, you know, be broader uh, in its research uh, perspective. Uh, and, and that's when, um, you know, people started, you know, uh, going to, you know, other places, uh, more tropical. Uh, and uh, yeah, so by the time I started in 1980, um, uh, we just happened to be interested in bats because the first mammal creator, uh, that was his interest. Um, and, and, and then that, and, then, and basically I've just sort of built on, you know, what was started uh, back in the 1960s. So, so can I, can I just ask you, uh, Burton, uh, are you talking about Mark Engstrom or who? Uh, the... uh, no, this is uh, Dr. Randolph Peterson. Uh, oh, yeah, yes, Mark, yes, yes. Yeah, so Mark started in the late 80s, yeah. uh, but Randolph Peterson actually started um, as the first mammal creator okay. uh, back in the uh, late 40s, uh, and he ended up retiring um, in the late 80s. Yeah, so, so basically, Mark Engstrom uh, took over uh, from uh, Randolph Peterson when he, when he retired in the late 80s. And then you're taking over from him. Uh, yeah, and, and then Mark uh, will officially retire at the end of this month. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah so I will be uh, carrying on the flag. Well, uh, Rajit, we, we, we are very fortunate to have someone like uh, uh, Burton uh, interested and in fact involved in doing some of the work surveying uh, bats in, in our homeland. Yes, uh, I mean, I mean, for, I'm studiously avoiding talking about dinosaurs, which is uh, something that the ROM uh, has got a very wonderful collection of. Um, so I think I think that um, next to birds and butterflies, mammals don't necessarily get the kind of publicity that they deserve compared to even dinosaurs, for that matter. Uh, and it's just very interesting how disparate organizations like the ROM, which is uh, like, you know, uh, far away is, uh, has having, is having so much involvement with Asian wildlife. I mean, in the Asian region we're talking about is like the, probably the, the most densely populated area in the whole world. And um, 
it's just very, very interesting how, how the ROM, uh, uh, I mean, it almost sounds un unusual. I don't think it's that unusual. Has started working. Has started has doing has started doing a lot of work in Asia, including Sri Lanka. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah. So my interest is actually um, you know tropical in 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 general. Uh, so I, I've actually done quite a bit of work in like you know Central and South America. Uh, but again, like you know, like for most organisms, you know, not just you know bats and mammals, um, but, you know, birds and insects, you know, the, the closer you get to the equator, um, you know, the more species diversity you get. Uh, so I, uh, so I, I study, you know, the biodiversity and evolution of mammals. Uh, so Canada doesn't have that much biodiversity. Uh, so I've just sort of gravitated, you know, to where a lot of the species are tropical places. So I started off in, you know, uh, the New World tropics. Um, but it was, I guess, uh, in the 90s uh, that I started working uh, in Asia, uh, Southeast Asia in particular. Uh, but it wasn't until 2000 and I'm trying to remember, it's in 2013, Ahsoka, that we yes, first went uh, no, to, to Sri Lanka? 2015, yeah, 2013, you came with me yeah. to Sri Lanka. An exploration. Then, yeah. uh, the, uh, we had an expedition uh, with the National Geographic Society and Ron. In 2015, with yeah. and Brock, Dr. Professor Fenton came with us. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. So for me, uh, the old world tropics um, is a sort of a new event, a newer adventure for me, and, and Sri Lanka is uh, even a newer one. Yes. So, Burton, uh, to some extent, I expect that your family connections, uh, I mean, your roots, might link you at some level with Asia. Is that true? Uh, well, well, both my parents uh, are uh, from China, mm. uh, so they came from um, Guangdong province, so the province yes. that borders Hong Kong, uh, but they, they immigrated to Canada uh, in the 1950s, um, so uh, I've been fortunate to be able to go uh, do field trips uh, in China, um, uh, but that wasn't again until uh, I think 2001, I think was the first time I actually got to China on field work. Because, I mean, Canada actually has displayed a great deal of leadership when it comes to uh, environmental matters. You've also got David T. Suzuki, uh, who's a major environmentalist in Canada, who's probably he's kind of got a Japanese connection. And he's, he's been a major spokesman about uh, environmental, um, um, the environmental uh, agenda. So it's just absolutely wonderful anyway that you are now doing, doing this work in Asia. And Rajit. Yes. Uh, just to intervene, um, uh, Burton has a cousin who lives in Sri Lanka. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, that's another connection. <laughs> so, so Burton, now um, what, you are joining a distinguished, distinguished bunch of scientists who've been working in this in the region of South Asia um, um, from a historical point of view. I mean, I could talk about somebody like Ho Hodge Hodgson who worked in um, Nepal, Nepal, and uh, a number of like British, uh, British uh, pioneers in mammalogy in the, in the region, uh, but also closer in time, you've also, you probably dealt with the Harrisons and the Harrison uh, research into, into bats in Sri Lanka. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I, I never met uh, David Harrison, but uh, Paul Bates, who uh, looks after the Harrison Museum now, uh, I've I met him uh, several times. Um, uh, I've never actually done any field work with him, but uh, I'm familiar with his work and uh, we've met at conferences before. Uh, yeah, so hopefully, um, you know, the more I get into sort of, uh, you know, the bats of Southeast Asia, uh, the more uh, sort of interaction or maybe even collaboration down the road. Yeah, and they did do a, um, they did do a, a fairly comprehensive uh, a book uh, about the bats of uh, South Asia, you know, they, they kind of did because uh, there haven't really been uh, many up-to-date uh, editions about the mammals of uh, South Asia done recently. I mean, there's one major major book that was done. Uh, I'm trying to remember actually the 1992 version, the mammals of Southeast Asia, the Southeast Asian subregion or something. That's quite a famous big book. And uh, then uh, the Harrisons did a book about the bats of South Asia. And but but obviously that's probably a great deal we don't know. Well, the, Ch Charles Francis did an excellent book on the mammals of South uh, East Asia, and he covered uh, uh, bats uh, quite comprehensively. And, and Charles Francis, of course, is also a Canadian uh, who works uh, for Parks Canada, I think, right? Uh, uh, correct, Burton? 
Uh, I, I think the Canadian Wildlife Service. I Canadian, believe. Yeah, that's right. And and um, so uh, so we have had some Canadian connections to that part of the world. And uh, uh, but I just wanted to point out that Burton is not only interested in bats, but you're also very interested in uh, small mammals, correct? Uh, yeah, so not uh, any of the small furry things, so not just bats, but also rodents, uh, shrews, opossums. Mm. Uh, yeah, so small mammals in general, uh, but, but, but bats in particular. Well, just for information, my, my supervisor was uh, Dr. Ch uh, Dr. Sarah Churchfield, who specialized in uh, shrews. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Now, the book, I, think, the book, I think shrews are probably even more trickier from a taxonomic perspective than bats are. Yeah, well, the book I was actually trying to get into my head, uh, Corbett and Hill. Corbett and Hill did the, started off yeah. kind of trying to summarize the mammals of the South, South, East, uh, the South Asian and Southeast Asian subregion recently. And this has been followed up with a few drip drip works, uh, major, major books. At the moment, we're, we're living off. Um, while well, living off the ma mammals of the world with like a kind of colored colored picture of every mammal, uh, I can who, who's doing it? The what's it? The, it's the Spanish one, the Span links edition. Yeah, yeah links, links yeah, edition. Links yeah. editions. Yes, I, I have I have the whole series, and I I must say it's a fantastic series. Uh, I mean, it's not as say comprehensive as uh, say the bats of South Asia. With you know, it, it's not as technical, but it certainly gives you a tr fantastic overview. Uh, and it, 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 it's, it's uh, detailed enough that, uh, you know, you can get a lot of, a lot of information out of it. Uh, yeah. well, Burton, would you agree? Uh, yeah, I, I have to agree because uh, I, I wrote a few of the species accounts. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, in, right. in the, bat, the bat volume uh, yes, for yes. both the Molossi, the free tail family, and also the, the New World um, uh, fruit bat family, Phyllostomidae. Um, but uh, as Ahsoka knows, with, uh, with a lot of these um, sort of field books or uh, species account uh, compendi compendiums um, is, uh, you know, when you, when you write these species accounts, uh, you realize, you know, how much, you know, we really don't know about a species, yeah. especially yeah. small things like bats. Because yeah. um, I'm sure Ahsoka is already probably sort of thinking about uh, a second edition of Mammals of Sri Lanka, you know, even before his book got published, you know, because... Um, People are working on it, but there's just so many species um, that you know the information just keeps adding up and adding up. Um, one so the, one, yeah, one of the sad things, though, uh, in terms of Sri Lanka, and and you know, I I'm, I I must say I'm I am working uh, on an update of my the book uh, that was published in 2013. Uh, although it will be much smaller uh, in terms of size, and it, it should it should be uh, one should be able to take it to the field. But uh, one thing that strikes me is how little uh, we have expanded knowledge since I wrote that book. I mean, there's hardly any work that has been done on small mammals in Sri Lanka, which is a, uh, which is a extremely worrying thing because there are so many pressures now on in terms of uh, uh, land, uh, people moving into area, you know, uh, uh, changes in in uh, jurisdictions, uh, changes in, in the way things are administered in Sri Lanka, where all these uh, tracts of land, uh, there's so much pressure is being put on these things and they may disappear. And uh, small mammals are the first one, first species uh, to be affected. Uh, yeah, and, and th those are the ones that are also, you know, the least known. So, yes. um, yeah, so we're, we're losing stuff that we don't even know what they do. Um, you know, some of the bats, you know, uh, you know, as we know, you know, have a lot of sort of eco they, they provide a lot of ecosystem services. Yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, they might be uh, dispersing seeds of, you know, fruits, um, you know, that might be of, you know, uh, agricultural concern. Yeah. Uh, they're also you know, uh, flower pollinators. Uh, mm -hmm. So they're doing a lot of things that, you know, we don't even know because we haven't had a chance to study, you know, study them. So that's and, all. And, and definitely, which all yeah. benefit us, which all benefit human beings. Yeah. Uh, the, the astounding thing is that uh, when you look at the, 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 mam the species in Sri Lanka, uh, the, the last records of the, we know that they exist, but the last records of these animals are from the 1930s. We, they haven't been seen. You know, several species have not been seen seen since then. 
Now that doesn't mean that they don't exist, but they haven't been seen. So, so this underlines the sort of critical importance of uh, surveying our bats, surveying our shrews, surveying our uh, mice to see what's out there and uh, what roles they play in our uh, in in, in uh, nature in Sri Lanka, etc. Well, yes, I, I think I just want to introduce a little general point that mammals, small mammals in particular, uh, maybe maybe bats uh, especially, don't get the kind of publicity that they deserve. I mean, Beatrix Potter never wrote a book about bats, I don't think. Uh, and uh, they didn't discover echolocation until the, I don't know, 1950s or 60s that, that bats actually had echolocation. Uh, I, mean, I mean, they're not as sexy uh, or they're not perceived as, as sexy as birds and butterflies um, to make popular books and cards and field guides and things like <laughs> that. So, I mean, Ahsoka has been uh, making a contribution to this area uh, and trying to bring more focus on the smaller mammals, which tend to get neglected. Why do you think that the smaller ma mammals uh, have such a publicity problem, uh, either of you? Uh, well, do you? And do you think that they should be having, they should be made a bit sexier? Well, I, I think the problem is that um, again, you know, they're small, you know, they're nocturnal, uh, you know, the, uh, the rodents and the shrews are secretive, you know, the bats fly, um, so people just don't really see them. So, you know, it's, it's quite unlike birds, uh, you know, you, you have small birds, but, you know, yeah. the birds in general are active in the daytime. If you have a good pair of binoculars and a good field guide, uh, you know, you can identify them, you can sort of interact with them a little bit better, whereas, you know, small mammals, you know, you literally have to catch them, you know, and get them in your hand to figure out they've got these big ears, they've got, you know, uh, stripes on their faces, or they've got these fleshy appendages. Uh, and then you realize, oh, you know, th th these things are actually quite intriguing. But again, the average person doesn't see that. So they, they don't know how interesting uh, these small mammals are. You know, it, it's kind of a chicken and egg situation because you were talking about, uh, Rajat, you were talking about, uh, why don't we give them the publicity? The publicity comes out of stories, like mm -hmm. uh, just as uh, as uh, Burton said. Uh, you know, when you see these uh, animals up close, uh, you know they have these uh, ears and eyes and fur and uh, abilities that we never thought uh, they, they did. And so you can write a story about them. You, can, you know, they become interesting. But right now, because there's so little research on these things, we don't know much about uh, these animals to tell people what what they do. And uh, unfortunately, in Sri Lanka and and you know all over the world, it's the iconic animals that get the uh, get the funding and the money uh, mm -hmm. for for research. I mean, the leopards and the elephants, which mm -hmm. which are which is fantastic. It's it's, uh, it's nice. and the bears. Uh, but the the little guys get uh, rolled over in this uh, uh, struggle for money. And it's not just uh, it's not just uh, many many of these small mammals that are endangered. It's the taxonomists who are studying them. So, for example, Burton, you, you're probably quite your mother might have challenged you about why you were actually studying bats, if I can put it that way. I mean, the fact of the matter is that studying bats is not necessarily a genius career move. Uh, if it, if it was like a popular perception. Uh, so taxonomists who actually study these things are, are becoming are rather limited, aren't they, in number? I mean, there's actually a crisis in taxonomy that there aren't enough taxonomists working on things like small mammals, mm -hmm. and the museums are getting stuffed, stuffed full of specimens with very few people to work on them. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's always, um, you know, uh, we, we always have to sell, or at least, at least I think I have to start, you know, selling myself more to make my, myself relevant. Uh, yeah, as you say, uh, they're, they're, you know, taxonomists, taxonomists are hard to come by nowadays. Uh, so you have to be, you know, a taxonomist and a conservationist or a taxonomist and a molecular systematist. Um, yeah, so uh, you just can't be a taxonomy guy like in the good old days, you know, uh, going on field trips. Uh, you, you, you have to sort of, um, you know, make, you know, what you study relevant. And, and, and actually, don't, I don't have a, a problem with that because uh, it should, you know, it should be more than just, you know, my research interest. Uh, I have to sort of make, you know, my, my work relevant. Um, so it's, so, so I, I actually see it as a challenge, um, you know, for like an up and coming biologist. 
uh, is difficult because there's just not that many, you know, jobs, museum jobs. Um, yeah, so I, I probably feel more sorry for them than I do for myself because I already have my job. <laughs> uh, but as yeah. you say, um, um, you know, there are not that many, you know, uh, sort of the traditional taxonomy positions around anymore. And yeah, this, I, com I, yes. sorry, this, co this comes at a time when taxonomy is getting much more complicated, really, with, with, uh, uh, with the DNA work uh, changing all the relationships uh, potentially. Uh, where the, the role of a taxonomist is that much more important now uh, and more complicated, yet the, the supply is getting lower, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think that um, somebody like you, Burton, I don't think that taxonomists uh, are interested in, develop, uh, in becoming, a, well, developing a monopoly. There's no such thing. It's not like a, a commercial area where you're trying to become the, the biggest company in the world. I don't. Th I think that at the moment that we are struggling to find people who are interested in these these subjects, and so this kind of brings me to the kind of the, the meat of what I would actually like to talk about, which is things to do with the CB, the C Convention on Bi Biological Diversity, the CBD, and the Nagoya Protocol. Uh, now these these laws, uh, this kind of uh, international framework came came into being in the 1990s, uh, and. Um, uh, many, many countries in Southeast Asia uh, allow lots of international work to, to, to go on in them. For example, uh, um, countries like Vietnam and uh, Thailand have got uh, an active, active uh, amount of research going on to do with things like snails uh, and uh, small mammals and very, maybe even fish. Um, but also the CBD provisions, which have been uh, interpreted uh, probably in quite a strict kind of way in countries like Sri Lanka, it's also been an obstruction to uh, biodiversity research, especially from uh, an international perspective. Uh, but I think that within the framework, it is perfectly possible to do uh, just, as, just as much work as, as was done in the good old days, if I can put it, put it like that. I mean, not that they were necessarily that good, but there was a time when people were uh, doing a, a lot of work, interna international explorers were traveling and doing lots of work, but it's becoming more and more hard. Do you see this as a significant barrier or, or or is it more to do with how it's interpreted? Uh, um, um, I, I don't have a problem. Um, you know, uh, I, I think we, you know, we need regulation and we need, uh, you know, permits to do things. So yeah, we can't do it like a hundred years ago where, you know, foreigners will show up, grab things and take them back home. Um, yeah, so I, 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 I am fully supportive of, you know, the permitting process. Um, I, uh, I just, uh, hope and would like that the process is transparent. So I, I know, you know, what it is. Yeah, so I, I know I need to fill out this form and that form. Uh, yeah, so, so that's not a problem. And, and I've been doing this for over 30 years now. And, um, and I, I must admit the, the paperwork is getting, you know, you know more thicker and more heavier. Um, but I, I totally understand that, you know, uh, all these regulations and permits are needed, you know, for, you know, international, you know, protocols and procedures. Um, but I, I must say that there are some countries um, uh, that, you know, you know some, some of them like Guyana, they'll post uh, all of their forms online and you mm -hmm. just download them and fill them out. Mm -hmm. uh, other places, um, you know, uh, well, I'll give China as an example. Um, they're all in uh, Chinese. And even though, you know, my ancestry is Chinese, I don't, I don't uh, read or write Chinese. Yeah. Uh, so unless you have a collaborator that will help you, you know, work it out, um, yeah, so there, there's that difficulty, um, you know, and I, I guess it's nothing new, you know, you know, you know, language barriers. Uh, so I, I don't think that's anything new. Um, but uh, just making it, uh, you know, more transparent, the process, um, I think that is one thing that, uh, and hopefully these international protocols, um, uh, you know, will make, you know, that process simpler. Hmm. But this, this, the, you know, the Guyana example is something that Sri Lanka should think about, uh, you know, we are, uh, it's, you know, all these uh, forms are posted online. I mean, in this day and age, this is, uh, it's, it's a very simple thing to do. And uh, 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 it's hard enough to, to approach Sri Lanka today because of all the restrictions that there are, they have built into the process. Uh, but at least if uh, a foreign researcher who, who 
who uh, wishes Sri Lanka well, who, who uh, is going to do a great favor to Sri Lanka, I mean, help them along by making the process as easy as, it, as possible. Yeah, yes, yes. I, I think a lot of um, countries, um, uh, yes, yeah, so basically the Nagoya, you know, protocol um, and the Convention on, on Biodiversity, um, uh, basically they, they give like very general parameters, but it's up to each country to come up with their own rules. Yes. Um, yeah, so maybe, uh, yeah, so basically, you know, every country does it a little bit differently, uh, which is yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think that 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 might be a bit of, <clears throat> I guess, sort of frustration, um, you know, for a person like me that wants to go to as many countries as possible. <laughs> I, I've got to, you know, relearn, you know, the the procedure. You know, uh, one of the one one of the concerns that I have is this term biopiracy. I've heard this uh, recently in Sri Lanka. You know that people are taking stuff out, orchids and stuff, and it's called biopiracy. And I, you know, I think there were times when people, uh, when certain Western companies came and took stuff out uh, and uh, developed uh, drugs or whatever. But, you know, to, 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 to let's face the facts. Uh, according to what I read in The Economist, it takes about a billion dollars to develop a drug. And it takes a billion more dollars to market it and sell it. Uh, this is something uh, if Sri Lanka, if we play, countries like Sri Lanka think that foreigners are stealing uh, stuff, uh, well, uh, it, it's it's what they get out is not free because they have to spend two billion dollars to market to sell whatever they develop, and we will, we will never have uh, an opportunity because we don't have the money to do that. So, do we sit on a cure for cancer? Uh, because we think some foreigners will come and steal all this stuff. I mean, uh, th these are things that we need to sort of face up to in Sri Lanka. And I think there's also a bit of a gray area, because um, I, I think a lot of times, from what I've read uh, in sort of the permit applications, is that a lot of times there's not um, a lot of distinction between um, sort of commercial research uh, and also, you know, just pure scientific research. Mm. Um, yeah, so as Ahsoka said, I, I don't think there's anything I do that's worth billions of dollars. No. Um, but again, so I, I fall under, you know, uh, you know, the genetic resource, you know, uh, use. Um, yeah, so people think that, you know, I'm, I'm going to make the better aspirin or something. Uh, um, <laughs> I think I, I'm going to, you know, make millions of dollars off of a species of bat I collect. Um, I haven't so far, so I don't think that's true. <laughs> uh, but I think sometimes there, um, I, I wish there was a distinction between, you know, sort of commercial use and sort of scientific use. I, I realize there are some areas, you know, probably like in botany where there, there is potential for a crossover. Uh, but I, uh, but that, that's one thing I, I would like to see um, in, you know, some of these inter international protocols is that, you know, there is a distinction between, you know, science, you know, just for, you know, pure science sake, as opposed to, you know, making money, you know, for big pharmaceutical companies or whatever. And for heaven's sake, I mean, we, uh, I mean, the, the project we are doing right now, we are hoping to do anyway, on the bats. Uh, we are trying, uh, Burton, perhaps you can uh, amplify on this. Uh, we are trying to survey all the bats in Sri Lanka, but using methods uh, that are completely benign. Uh, instead of trapping them, uh, we want to uh, build up a library of uh, bat uh, echolocation sounds so that uh, using a, an echo meter, we can figure out which bats are in which environments in Sri Lanka. Right, Burton? Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, that, that's uh, saying it the easy way. Um, yeah, so it, it's um, a little bit different from, say, you know, you know bird songs, um, where they're very stereotypic. Uh, you know, because they're, they're really for mating purposes. Uh, so each species needs to know the other species. Uh, whereas, you know, as you know, for bat echolocation calls, as Ahsoka knows, um, you know, bats can have a whole variety of calls. Uh, and the only ones that are really useful are the ones where uh, bats are looking for food because they're, they're actually quite regular. Um, 
uh, yeah, so the problem with the bat calls, um, you have to, you know, know which species is attached to that call. Yes. So yes, you can easily put up a recorder and record, you know, gigabytes of data in one night. Um, but if you can't, you know, put the species to that call, uh, that's the difficult part. Um, yeah, so you still have to um, get that sort of basic level of knowledge. So you, you still have to catch the bat, you know, just to verify that's the species. Uh, and as you let it go, you can record the call saying, okay, so now I know for certain that this call goes to that bat. Um, yeah, so we'll, I mean, we're getting there, but um, that certainly has not been done with all of the species of bats. Um, yeah, so, it, uh, so what Osoka says is true, but it's still in sort of the infancy uh, stage of research. Yes, I mean, to build up that library. Yeah. This kind of work can only be done using international collaboration. I mean, you know, you've got to have people who are Sri Lankans who are helping you. You've got to have international, you've got to have recording um, specialisms. Any kind of work of this, this complexity now takes on an international dimension, doesn't it? So I think that it's very, very difficult. I mean, if, if, if it was just up to like Sri Lankan specialists and experts to uh, generate uh, some useful and interesting uh, data uh, that, that's of relevance. Uh, it, it, it's much, much, much richer if it's done at an international level. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, um, yeah, the international collaborations, um, you know, they're fun <laughs> because you get to meet different people. Yes. Uh, but, but also you, you get to network with other people. Um, you know, they might have a different perspective on, you know, looking at this particular species um, that, you know, maybe, you know, you were blind to. Uh, yeah, so I, I think it's uh, the networking also sort of opens up your eyes and, you know, thinks in a broader context. Um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, these international, you know, collaborations, I, I think they're beneficial, you know, from a whole different, you know, a bunch of different perspectives. Yes. So, I mean, Sri Lanka has been... Uh culturally important uh, for, for a long time, you know, as like, you know, it's the use of spices and that kind of thing. And it's, uh, it exports um, lots of, used to export lots of exotic things that the rest of the world needed, like pepper and uh, ivory. And I'm trying to think of it, yeah, something else, but lots and lots of different spices. It was definitely part of the spice archipelago. Uh, why is it that international researchers like yourselves uh, why is it that you actually want to study stuff in Sri Lanka? I mean, why is Sri Lanka relevant? And is there an interest in studying uh, the biodiversity of Sri Lanka? I'm actually picking up a cue that Asoka uh, planted in me earlier. Why is it that international people like to work in, a, work in places like Sri Lanka, for example? Can I, can I just, uh, before Burton answers, can I just say something? I mean, I gave a lecture at a bat conference in Guelph, uh, Ontario, in Canada, about in 2010, I think. Uh, I was talking about the bat, uh, the richness of the bat, uh, bats in Sri Lanka, and after the uh, after I spoke, I was absolutely inundated with people uh, from the states, uh, for, say from the Smithsonian, from Field Museum. All these people were were asking, "How can I get involved in bat research in Sri Lanka?" So, so there is a tremendous amount of interest. And then maybe Burton, maybe you can tell, tell us why. Uh, well, I think just from a biological perspective, um, it's like an island. Uh, so, um, you know, th there's been whole fields of study on like island biogeography. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, I mean, basically, you know, that's how speciation, that's how evolution, or at least one mechanism, you know, is to isolate, you know, a population. Uh, and if there's, you know, no interbreeding or no gene flow, uh, then over time, um, you know, things could potentially turn into a different species. Um, yeah, so from a biological perspective, um, uh, it's, you know, uh, basically it's an evolutionary model, you know, Sri Lanka. Um, you know, it's an island off, you know, uh, off the coast of India, uh, but close enough that, you know, things do, you know, so it's not like it's totally isolated. Uh, yeah, so as I think there's always been that that sort of intrigue, uh, you know, from a evolutionary biology perspective. But also, I think uh, uh, Sri Lanka has been known to be very uh, uh, rich in uh, in endemics. So, uh, uh, I mean, not necessarily mammals, but certainly in plants, in frogs, in uh, in um, uh, in crabs, in land crabs. So. 
and and even in mammals i mean um, uh, we we uh, i think we have about 32 species of 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 bats in sri lanka and uh, many of the 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 the, 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 the shrews are endemic uh, so uh, there because of the isolation uh this over evolutionary time these 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 phenomena phenomena uh phenomena have 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 occurred and so i think biologists are very um sort of intrigued by this i mean burton have you worked if i just ask as kind of bit of a digression have you worked in madagascar um no i i was hoping to get to madagascar uh, back in uh, the early 90s uh, and I thought Madagascar would uh, sort of be my first introduction, you know, to sort of the old world. Um, but that trip uh, never happened. Uh, so we ended up going to uh, Vietnam instead. Hmm. Uh, so that was in, I think, 96, I believe. Um, so uh, I've always wanted to go to Madagascar. I thought I was going to go to Madagascar uh, in the mid 90s, uh, but it never did happen. Uh, well, but uh, but I, I've been to other island uh, like I, I I've just started recently working in the Caribbean. Uh, Caribbean. Islands, yeah. What about Taiwan? Uh, I visited Taiwan as a child, <laughs> but uh, no no, uh, no field work there. Okay, because I mean I've always been intrigued by the I mean minor connection. I mean Taiwan is to uh, Taiwan is to India what I mean what. What I mean, it's Taiwan and India, uh, Sri Lanka and India are, are a little bit similar to Taiwan and China, in that kind of relationship. And but I think that Taiwan has probably got quite a lot of interest in biodiversity, and it's probably about the same size as Sri Lanka, if not a bit bigger. I don't really know actually. I don't really know the size of it exactly. But uh, the fact of the matter is that the Oriental region, culturally, historically, uh, has has always been a kind of a, a center of the world, if you like. You know, in terms of uh, like, um, well, I mean, like cultures, foods, and I mean, like the, the largest number of people in the world now, you can kind of draw a circle and like 50% of the world's population lives inside that circle in that fits into the Oriental region. Uh, and, and the other 50% are outside of that ring. Um, so the Oriental region is a kind of gravity of, of, of like human beings. It's a kind of gravitational center of human beings, if you're if you kind of like putting it metaphorically. So it's very interesting, very intriguing area. I mean, with a lot of interconnected wildlife uh, and I mean, things we, uh, lots of spices and connected associated wildlife with a lot of historical input as well. So I think that there, is, there are so many puzzles to pieces, pieces of the puzzle to fill in that area in particular, I think, compared to many other parts of the world. Um, and I think, you know, it's very, very, I think that we're very, very fortunate in Sri Lanka, thanks to Asoka, that, that you had this little bit of involvement to do some sort of sampling. I mean, and, um, and also maybe this is a point for you, for you to talk about some of the work you've done already to do with the island. Uh, is that, uh, sorry, is that uh, for Asoka or... Well, for both of you, okay. both of I mean, you. I, I, mean. I, I would love to go back to Sri Lanka. Just the, the opportunity um, ha hasn't uh, come up again. Hmm. Uh, so I, I have uh, I have not written Sri Lanka off. Uh, I do plan on going. Uh, when exactly, I don't know. But uh, uh, but ho hopefully uh, there will be more uh, work for me in the future. You were there last in 2013? Uh, 2015. 2015, 2015. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm trying to uh, sort of uh, uh, set up some sort of an operation that would uh, help with uh, uh, research on small mammals. I mean, I think there's a lot of good work being done with the larger mammals in Sri Lanka, uh, but the small mammals have been neglected. And I, I would love uh, to be some sort of a catalyst, if I could, uh, for people to come and be interested in doing research on uh, foreigners, uh, uh, research on uh, our small mammals, because we know so little uh, ecologically, taxonomically, there are so many uh, aspects of small mammals that, that we do not know in Sri Lanka. And, and, and as you know, I am desperate that we we get this stuff done uh, before they all go extinct. And and if we don't know that they exist, they will. 
because it's only when we know what's out there that we can save it. I mean, Burton, you might be familiar with uh, the, the mammal survey of India that took place um, um, roughly, I think it was from the early part of the 19, roughly from about 1912 to about, about, about roughly about 1930, roughly. Um, and um, lots and lots of publications came out of the, the mammal survey, survey of India, the Bombay Natural History Mammal Survey, it has to be said, uh, lots of things were published. And my impression is that since about the 50s, very little has been published until relatively recently now. I mean, maybe, maybe work, people, uh, work that was uh, published by people like the Harrisons. So that there, has been, there has been a large lacuna of research uh, historically uh, between, between the 50s and relatively recently. And then there has been a resurgence of interest in South Asian biodiversity, maybe since about the 1990s. And so I think there's every opportunity for, I think that the interest is there. The question is what can be done with, I mean, partly because of uh, problems with regards to regulation and uh, any other assistance that, that might be lacking. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, from my own experience, um, as I mentioned, um, when I started working uh, in Asia, it was more Southeast Asia. Oh. Um, but I, uh, you know, as I got more into uh, the field work and the research, I realized that uh, a lot of the scientific names are based on, you know, holotype specimens that are from India. Oh. Uh, and, and Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka, and then we, we found uh, quite a bit of genetic, you know, variation, you know, uh, you know, within Southeast Asia, you know, not even, you know, without even mentioning, uh, you know, South Asia, uh, but a lot of the names that were used in Southeast Asia are names, you know, that came from South Asia. Huh. Um, and like, uh, like Kerry Bauda, like, like Kerry Bauda, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but, 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 but nobody uh, was really doing any, you know, much contemporary work, you know, when I started uh, in the 90s. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, it's, it's starting to change over a, a little bit, you know, more now. Um, but uh, but it, I'm just waiting, you know, for, you know, sort of, um, you know, that sort of bridge to occur where we have enough work, you know, again, in South Asia uh, that we can solve, you know, some of these, you know, taxonomic issues you know, you know, right across Asia, uh, you know, for a lot of these widely distributed, uh, and, and some of them are actually quite common uh, species. Um, yeah, so I, I think, uh, I think we're approaching the cusp, or we're at the cusp. Yes. Uh, yeah, so we just need to uh, continue, uh, continue that collaborative I mean, I'm, research. I'm aware that Rohan Petya Guda right now is working on a lot of, lot of stuff to do with biogeography of the region. Mm -hmm. And they've been especially working, there's this recent paper that came out on, uh, on uh, freshwater fish. And um, I mean, are you aware of some of these biogeographical work? Um, in general, um, I haven't uh, really read, uh, you know, too much about it. I mean, it's hard enough just keep keeping up on, you know, the mammal, you know, literature. You know, yes. Let alone uh, the fish and the herbs uh, and plants and, and whatnot. Uh, but, but I am aware that uh, there, there is a sort of a building, you know, body of literature uh, coming up. And do you have a, a connection, if I may ask, uh, and I'm putting various other people who might be interested into the picture here, uh, in the Australian Museum? I mean, Rohan Petyagoda, for, for example, right now he's working on the fish in the Australian Museum. And people who are linked uh, in that Southeast Asian region and the, and the Australasian and the Southeast Asian region, I mean, we can mention a few names and there might be some connections that are possible, which could act as a kind of catalyst Towards uh, towards towards uh, creating a synthesis of of some of these these uh, diverse bits of research that could point out to a very interesting story with implications for evolution as well as conservation and other things. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that is you know again a, a great example of you know comparative biology. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I specialize in bats, you know, um, uh, but you know the more. Um, studies that are done in other groups, um, you know, that, that will be sort of a test of, you know, um, evolution or island biogeography, you know, uh, the bats do this, you know, what do, what do fish do, what do birds do? Um, yeah, yeah, so again, uh, but that's like, you know, the second level of, you know, sort of evolutionary biology research is, you know, you, know, you do the best you can yes. you know, with yes. your yes. stuff, 
Yes. Uh, and then you say, okay, well, how does it compare with insects or whatever? Uh, and then we get like a, a, a like a better overall, you know, view of, of what's happening. Yes. You know, one, one thing that has fascinated me is the relationship between uh, the biota in Sri Lanka and uh, and the one in India. How, uh, what the relationships have been over time because uh, with the emergence of the uh, land bridge between India and Sri Lanka, there have been lots of exchanges and then when it's cut off, it's, it's uh, isolated and uh, there's speciation and stuff like that. And then, then some of the animals go back to India and stuff like that. And so many of our groups have had this history uh, and like, uh, you know, there were at one point there were tigers and lions in Sri Lanka. So we have had this 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 relationship, uh, which uh, uh, you know, to me, it's uh, uh, there are hints of it. But I would love to see a full study done of the relationship. Now, what about conservation? I mean, how desperate are we? The thing is that we are living uh, we are living at a, in the middle of a con um, what they call. Uh, a sixth mass extinction and everybody's talking about a kind of climate uh, climate catastrophe and all this kind of stuff uh, what's the word the word is uh, climate emergency and things like that i mean with, with all this publicity about the biodiversity crisis we're having um at, at the same time there seems to be little political political action uh especially in in, in poorer countries and um and i think i think that there's a huge role for taxonomy and biodiversity to, to make a contribution towards this. Um, so even if many, many of these animals are going to become extinct, which they probably will under the current situ um, circumstances, um, I think that there is something to be recorded about the, di the, the, the diversity that, that existed. And I mean, there's so much to be done. I mean, do you think that, I mean, we were we, in the beginning, we, we talked about COVID and a, and a and funny, funnily enough, how how uh, bat research could contribute to COVID research. So, in this context, there's a sense of urgency, isn't there, to study this stuff? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I can uh, sort of give a Canadian uh, example, um, not not climate change per se, but um, you, you had been mentioning about you know documenting you know like biodiversity. Um, yeah, so uh, you know the one example I was going to mention was. Um, like in North America, we've had uh, this white nose syndrome disease that has been killing, you know, millions of bats. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's a, a recent invasive species. Um, it started in 2006. So that, you know, um, the fungus actually came over from Europe, where it's found naturally. But of course, the bats here didn't have any immunity against uh, this fungus, uh, so millions of bats have died. Um, and three of the species in Canada of bats uh, were put on the endangered species list uh, in the last few years. Um, but our, our museum collections had, um, you know, examples of, you know, where, you know, individuals of these three species were found in Ontario, or not just Ontario, but in Canada. Um, but, but basically that, that's documenting, you know, um, uh, you know not, not climate change, but it, it documents uh, the historical record of species, um, you know, for, for white nose syndrome, because, you know, we know that you know, 1930, um, you know, the little brown bat was found in this place in, you know, northern Ontario. Uh, but this, the same can be also done with, you know, climate change, um, you know, because, you know, we keep a historical record of, you know, what species were found where. Uh, but of course, if you don't have those records, you, you have nothing to compare other than saying, oh, I think it was there. I don't know. But if you have a museum record of it, you know where it was found and when it was when it was collected, uh, then you can compare it uh, going back in historical times to what's happening now. Is it climate change or is it something else? Um, yeah, so I, I think that's one of uh, that, that's a good example of uh, you know the value of natural history collections is that um, it documents you know species diversity uh, in. Uh, in place and in time, but of course, if you never made those collections a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. you can't go back in time and make them. Yeah, so I'm not saying you know you need to collect everything in sight, but you definitely do need to do some type of you know regular monitoring or regular you know uh, survey work 
um, because, um, you know, 50, 100 years down the road, um, it might become valuable information. And if you don't do it now, um, you can't go back uh, and do it. Um, yeah, yeah. So again, um, I, I think that's one of the values of the museum collections is that uh, I think it will be becoming more valuable for climate change as climate change you know, becomes, you know, you know, more of an issue in the forefront. Now, uh, Rajit, I, I have a question for you. Now, I, I'm not a relig religious person, but I, I know you are. Uh, and I know you're a, a very, uh, very uh, uh, good Buddhist, uh, et cetera. Um, would um, the, the, you know, uh, I, I see an emergence of a more militant Buddhism in Sri Lanka right now. Uh, and uh, whether it's because of some of the civil disturbances we've had over the last uh, few decades uh, and uh, some of the other sort of political developments, I don't know, but um, is that militant Buddhism uh, or will that militant, militant Buddhism affect uh, the, the ability of science to do its work? Uh, like collecting specimens, for example, will that be an issue uh, if uh, uh, the the people at the top uh, feel that uh, that's uh, not okay in terms of uh, faith? Well, my my answer is that uh, whatever whatever militant Buddhism there is, and I think it's actually very unfortunate that there should be some kind of militant Buddhism. I don't think that it should get in the way of uh, research because I don't think that militant Buddhists are waging a campaign to stop the fishing industry, for example. Right. So in that kind of context, um, I think that collecting a few specimens for research purposes should not really get in the way of any kind of militancy, uh, uh, which, which could be which could be an example, which could be uh, due to a, a, a kind of bigger, bigger human situation, rather than something connected with um, the, the ethics of uh, ethics of wild wildlife, uh, wildlife issues. So that's just that's what I think. So I don't think that I don't think that religions should get in the way of science. I actually think that they should they should support each other in many in, in some way. I, I, I agree. I agree, and I'm very encouraged to hear that. From yes, you. and, and yeah. the thing is that I think that one of the things that this kind of podcast illustrates is that today, unlike in the past, uh, we are having a lot of opportunities for people all over the world to start participating and discussing and exploring historical and current trends in biodiversity uh, because I mean uh, you know it's just ironic we have the biodiversity heritage library and suddenly all these old archives are being made available online and then we've got hundreds and hundreds of YouTube videos about keeping fish and pet fish and all kinds of biodiversity issues so I think that you know, there, there was a bit of a danger that all these publications, all the work that the great people have done in the past, uh, various taxonomists, uh, were ending up in library books with, with absolutely nothing happening and it's just like accumulating and not, but not many people to pay attention to them. But now we are seeing a kind of opening up of information and an exchange of ideas and views and also international collaboration. And I'm just wondering, uh, I mean, starting with Burton, Burton, do you notice that there's more of an interest in a kind of zeal for knowledge and information driven by the internet and the, and the online online activities like this uh, that, that you're facing with, with, with your work? Um, I, I think it's a great thing, uh, you know, yes. if the more people that have an interest uh, in it, um, you know, uh, all, all the better and, uh, you know, sort of the, the open access. Uh, so the, the Biodiversity Heritage Library, I, I think, is you know, is a great um, sort of open access digital format. Uh, and, and in fact, I think a lot of um, like libraries, I think the University of Toronto library system um, is, is one of the main uh, institutions that have, have actually been digitizing a lot of those uh, old, uh, you know, journals and publications, uh, getting them online. Uh, yeah, so, so I, you know, to me, I, I think that's a great thing, um, you know, you know, spreading the knowledge, uh, you know, through the internet, you know, uh, people always complain about, you know, the Wikipedia and, yes. you know, say, well, if that's the only knowledge you go by, uh, you know, just because it's not, it's not peer reviewed, right? You know, uh, so basically you, you can put it whatever you want, yeah. you know, uh, on, on the internet. Um, but, I, but I think in general, I think it, um, it allows, you know, people to communicate and to get ideas. And uh, yeah, so in general, I, I think, you know, that, dissemination of knowledge, um, I think is good. And you know, to me, 
uh, the, digi the digital commons is important because uh, for example, like, um, uh, I mean, currently in Sri Lanka, there is a problem uh, with some new rules that are trying to loosen uh, the, the, the administration of lands. Uh, and Rajit, you sent me an article by uh, Dinazad, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Rahim and, 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 and uh, I spoke to people in Sri Lanka and, and there is a lot of buzz, uh, uh, you know, um, on the internet uh, uh, to, to try to uh, organize and, and present arguments against uh, the, the regulations that are mooted. Uh, and so, I mean, th those are important things. I mean, in those days, uh, when there wasn't any of this facility, uh, you know, important people on top made decisions and we just uh, sat there and, and took it, right? Now today, if uh, there is any uh, regulation that comes in, which uh, say conservationists think uh, is uh, inimical to the interests of uh, uh, the, the biodiversity in Sri Lanka, they, they will organize, try to organize uh, and, and uh, present forces against it. So, uh, so as I said, the digital commons is important. And so in terms of what you said about today's way of communicating, I think uh, that's a very positive thing. Well, yeah, so if I can end on, end on a kind of note of hope, I mean, one of the things that makes me despair about biodiversity research in places like Sri Lanka and India is that a long time ago, there were these distinguished um, foreigners, uh, if I can put it bluntly, who started pioneering biodiversity research. I mean, they were like, they were like people like planters and um, collectors and curators who, were, who happened to be on the island and they started documenting the wildlife for the first time. And they did a huge amount of work. You know, a lot of it is available on the Biodiversity Heritage Library. And they were like the pioneers of uh, natural history in, in some of these locations. And then, then they, they get completely forgotten. And one wonders, you know, why, why, why were they doing it? Or what, what did, what did what, what their contribution amount to? And suddenly, we now have a chance more than ever before to rediscover these things, thanks to the online situation as well. And I think that, Burton, you know, we have to be very grateful for people like you who are carrying that tradition these pre of your predecessors of these people who actually started the pioneering work that tradition and um, that is just uh, this is just a the wonderful wonderful opportunity for uh, collaboration uh, for science and also uh, I mean there are lots of economic and other advantages in it as well um, you know lot, lots of publicity I mean organizations like the National, the National Geographic Society that thrive on uh, international exploration so there is something quite exciting, I think, potentially, um, uh, but to, to open up the doors to more, more biodiversity research and to carry on this work uh, so that, so that th the work that, that people historically have done isn't in vain because there is uh, so, much, uh, so, many, so much groundwork has been done. And it's just a wonderful thing that I think that this is the difference between uh, Asian Asian biodiversity and other parts of the world is that Asian biodiversity has been covered historically and and so there's so much more richness that you can build up on. Do, do you see it that way maybe, uh, Dr. Um, yeah, well, it be, being that, you know, I mean, one of my main interests is taxonomy. Um, huh. You know, uh, I, so I, I need to know, um, you know, that old literature, you know, especially yes. when I'm trying to figure out, you know, what name to attach, you know, to a certain bat or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. So for me, um, you know, that old literature uh, is very, very important, um, you know, to an ecologist to studying, you know, uh, behavior, um, you know, that might not be the case where they, they need to dig into the old literature, you know, about names and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, definitely for me, uh, I, I do appreciate, you know, that, um, you know, sort of historical connection because, uh, just because of the, of the field of study that I'm in, taxonomy is that, um, you know, uh, for me to do my work properly, uh, I, I need access, you know, to that old literature. Uh, and uh, yeah, so having it available online, um, you know, through uh, the Biodiversity Heritage Library uh, archives. Um, yeah, so before, uh, 
as some of you might know, you would have to, you know, find the reprint of it, mm. you know, in the, in the, at a university library or something. Uh, but now you can just sit at your desk and your computer and download PDF copies. Uh, yeah, so so that that's why I'm a big uh, advocate uh, of sort of the open access because uh, it does uh, make it easier, um, you know, to get to these historical documents that you you talk about. And can I just uh, uh, mention that at least one species of bat has been named after Burton? <laughs> but not, not that long ago, not, not, not that historical. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, think it's, I think it's a wonderful thing that there is such a kind of fusion of time and space and also cultures. Um, I, mean, I mean, leaving aside our roots, which are actually actually part of it, that, that, that this is this is the kind of modern day world where we're, we're not necessarily being nationalistic, uh, like we're, we're a mixture of, I mean, like we're, we're living in different countries, maybe a bit removed from the countries that we were we were growing up in. Uh, you know, that there's a kind of fusion of religions and cultures and races and and, and it's just how, how interestingly that we can start focusing on certain parts of the world and trying to make sense of it. Um, and also, we're also looking at non-human beings, uh, where, where I look at it, I mean, like, you know, wild, wildlife, we're looking at non-human beings, the alternative organisms that, that, that you know, that, that's not much in the news. And somebody's got to pay attention to, 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 to wildlife, because wildlife uh, doesn't really have much of a voice. And this is one of the reasons I'm pursuing these sorts of, this kind of work uh, of communication. So... Um, you know, I mean, giving giving uh, giving wildlife a voice and and putting them on the map, uh, and also turning it into a kind of a kind of human enterprise of of um, things bringing things together. I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful opportunity. So um, maybe maybe I'll, I'll I'll be bringing this conversation to a close. But before I do, I would just like to uh, like like for you to talk about your aspirations for the future and your hopes about what 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 uh, immediate or medium term work that that should be done and should be pursued. Um, well, I, I would, um, I mean, you, you sort of touched upon it, um, you know, sort of that international collaboration, um, you know, is beneficial, you know, from a number of different, you know, perspectives, um, you know, coming from, you know, a museum environment myself, um, you know, I've, I've been, you know, working here for, you know, over 30 years, you know, uh, collecting you know, around the world. Mm. Uh, so I, I appreciate, um, you know, th there is some se sentiment about, you know, foreigners, you know, some people look at it as a great as international collaboration, other people look at it as, you know, you know, why are foreigners coming, uh, you know, to my country to do this work. Yeah. Uh, but from a museum perspective, um, you know, as, especially for like mammals, um, is that, you know, um, you collect a voucher specimen, uh, it can only be at one place. Um, uh, you know, so it's not like, you know, a plant specimens where you can, you know, take a, a leaf and you know, you can sample, you know, different leaves and fruits from the same, you know, plant, you know, specimen and distribute it, you know, throughout the museums in the world, whereas, you know, for a bat or a bird specimen, it, it can only reside in one place. Um, yeah, so I, I, I see, you know, my museum, the ROM, is just, you know, being the repository of these international, you know, collections. Um, and, uh, yeah, because I, I realize that not all museums or institutions will have, you know, like minus 80 freezers, you know, to keep mm -hmm. tissue samples for genetic work. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, and, but basically, um, you know, if researchers, you know, ask, you know, to, um, you know, to borrow specimens uh, for them to examine, you know, from wherever I've worked, um, you know, if, as long as they're at a uh, research institution, um, we uh, basically were obligated, you know, to make those specimens available. Yeah, yeah. so the general rule is, as, as I'm sure you know, is that, you know, the sending institution sends it, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, with their funds, but when it gets returned, you know, the loaning institution, you know, will cover the cost of that. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so a lot of people, um, you know, look at you know, you know, sort of the museums as, you know, uh, you know, owning the specimens. I don't think that's true. And I think that's part of the Nagoya process and, and I'm not sure whether they really understand that. Yeah, so the specimen, yes, that has to be someplace, um, but it has to be available. So, so we're, we're not claiming it, you know, you know, mm. to be belong to the ROM. This, the ROM is just looking after it, you know, for the international mm. community. So it's a, um, it's, it's, a, it's a repository. Yeah. 
yeah, so, so, as, uh, so I, I look forward in the future for more international collaboration, yes. uh, you know, yes. in a more open style, um, you know, making things freely available. Um, but, but I do realize that when collections are made, you know, they have to reside in a particular place. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I don't, and, and, and most of the times when I do do collections, um, you know, rep, you know the, the collection does get split you know, between, you know, my institution and, uh, and then the, um, you know, the local museum and, and the country that I'm working in. And Ashoka, do you have anything to add? Well, yes, I mean, uh, the fact that we, to me, uh, it's a terrific opportunity because now the, the, the fact that we don't, we, we, we know so little about uh, our small mammals, it is a terrific opportunity from, from my perspective because it is an opportunity to, to set up a, uh, some uh, mechanism to, to get that information. And so I'm, I'm, my dream is to set up some sort of a, a small mammal research center uh, in Sri Lanka. In fact, uh, uh, in pursuit of that, I have found some land down south uh, we've got about 130 acres that uh, we've been told that we'd get. Uh, it's just that now I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find the, the, the uh, funding for it uh, to, to, to build the lab and to uh, get um, sort of funding for operational funding. So uh, that's, that's where I, my, my, uh, Focus is on that right now, and of course, I'm also doing my uh, revision of my book, um, and uh, that should keep me going until I kick the bucket at some point. But <laughs> uh, and at at age seventy one, uh, the 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 world is the time is getting shorter by the day. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for. Uh, this wonderful conversation that we've been having and uh, I, I, I wish you well with, with, with your projects, especially connected with South Asia and I hope that, uh, that, that there can be more action with regards to uh, classifying and uh, um, classifying the, the bats of Sri Lanka and identifying them a, 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 lot, a, a lot better. Uh, I think that at the moment we're sit still sitting on a lot of data and we're waiting for it to be processed and obviously it's a very time consuming process. Uh, but uh, anybody who is interested in this story uh, could theoretically contact me. So thank you very much for uh, for your time and uh, uh, and um, and maybe maybe we'll meet up again. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank, thank, thank you, you very you. much, uh, Rajit. Uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Yes. So so the, the recording.